Welcome back, my friends, to the sweet spot where IT leaders share the insight with other leaders and others that want to lead. My name is Carlos Vargas, and as every week, I have my two co hosts, Howard Holton, Paul Lewis. Hey, uh, hello, hello, my friends. How's it going? Hey, one of these times, I, I want to do the intro, but have you replaced the voice with yours? <laughs> so it's just my mouth moving, but it's still your intro? You know nice. that I have now my virtual clone voice. Yes. <laughs> so I actually, that would be. So hilarious. Oh, that would be funny, right? Use the clone voice to to do the whole thing? With with, with the opposite uh, mm -hmm. pictures. Yeah, that'd be funny. It'd be funny. We gotta try that. <laughs> All right, there you go. There's an exercise. We're getting into my favorite time of the year. We're getting into fall. I love fall. It's by far my favorite time, right? Is it cooler than summer? Is that what you... Well, it's cooler than summer plus. I like the leaves change. I actually like the point where you start to put on a jacket, but you don't have to have it all the time. Carlos, do you experience any of this? Leaves changing, you, you, putting on jackets? <laughs> you know, I was going to say that. We, we start getting our jackets out here in Florida. It, the funniest thing is when you go out, and it may be 75-ish, 70, but you see the woman with the big fur coats, the long boots. Like I'm like, are you going to snow or something? It's cold. It's chilly. Uh, at least I I have never changed like wardrobe. Like I always use like if I have long sleeve, I use them the whole year. If I have oh. jeans, I use them the whole year, even when it's cold. I just All right. put no, a jacket on no, top. You have no seasonal wardrobe. wardrobe attire. No, I I I I am more of a fashion. So I want to look in a certain way. I look the whole year, and I then the only change is like I have a a, a nice uh, winter coat. That actually is a, it's a nice dress code. So that's the only, but the inside, like I can't stand something too warm on top mm -hmm. of me. It, it drives me insane. So, no, no, sir. That's why we have layers. That's right. You take the modern off as you, as you yeah. wear. I mean, I would wear gauze as my main layer if I could, because the lighter, the better. <laughs> <laughs> only the important parts. I mean, yeah. I mean, what do I need to cover the rest of it for? If I don't step outside, it's not blinding to anybody. <laughs> I uh, I went and met my one of my new teams this week um, in another office, um, and I met people that I've only met virtually and didn't realize that most of the time they wear shorts and flip flops. Sure. So that would, you know, their their uh, their business up top and party down below. I mean, I, I think that's thoroughly acceptable. <laughs> it, I, I think it's acceptable at home. I'm less sure that translates to meeting them in the office. Um, eh, I don't know. I don't care. I mean, yeah, it depends. It depends on what, like, I've worked in some industries where I don't really care if you wear flip-flops and T-shirts and shorts. I, I don't really care. I've worked in other industries where it's like, no, don't, don't. Like, closed-toed shoes and, and long pants are... And something with buttons, you know, and, right. and something with buttons. The pants should have buttons in a zipper. Well, the shirt, <laughs> the shirt should have buttons. Is my point. Yes, yes. No elastic pants. <laughs> no elastic pants. And, and quick release buttons are not buttons, so there's none of that. Snap it off. I'm not a huge. Yeah, go ahead. It's interesting because depending on the office that you go, and one time I was downtown in Miami. And the people working in the office, it was like a fashion show. Hmm. Even during the day, like literally like a fashion show. It was it was interesting. Yeah. Because they didn't have to dress up at home, so they might as well dress up to come to the office. To I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's some people that that legitimately that that was kind of their social out, outlet. And and yeah, I mean, if you're if you're into fashion, being able to dress up for work was kind of nice and and hmm. you could enjoy that. Um, it didn't ever apply to me, not remotely. Because um, I'm not a fashionable. I, I worked at one place where everybody was kind of fashionable. Um, it was a car dealership, and and all the like the execs that that hired me, that brought me in, that I spent most of my time with, they were pretty fashionable, right? And I could Ooh. not afford to play in that. And I had gotten a promotion, and so they're like, "Well, like you know, you should start start dressing like us." And I did it for like two weeks. And they're like, um, "You know, the other option is we can just you could just wear the clothes that everybody else wears." And I was like, "Oh, wait, the uniform? Yeah, I'll do this to the uniform." <laughs> yeah, that's way because it was like it was literally um pants and a shirt 
and you would drop them off every week and they would clean them and then you'd have uh, you know your 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 fresh spares on monday and it was great right. like you mean i don't have to think about this shit anymore i don't have to f- like i never have to hear from you guys my socks don't match my belt kind of crap i oh this is, <laughs> this is amazing yeah i'm i'm 100 into that wow Ooh. i haven't heard that in a long time and i remember that the the shirt the tie on the belt sorry the the, the tie shoes well, what's it and something like that it's all of it is stupid all of it is stupid right um it's i'm 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 much more like paul this is the uniform you wear when you're on stage and it's the same uniform because it doesn't actually matter that that it's the same thing because um very few times you're going to be seen in two corresponding days where you're in the same thing right like there's plenty of time to get that drag lane um but but it doesn't work with um it doesn't work with uh you know when you're in an office every day you can't wear the same thing every day unless it's the uniform Right. I found the uniform hugely comforting. You know, it's interesting that at the end of the day, we're all focused on trying to get the business moving forward. So what the heck have we done this week that is interesting? Try to figure out who my ideal customer is. Hmm. Okay. okay. Um, like, uh, I've been at small businesses. I've been at large businesses. There are things that are way easier to do at big business. Right? At a large kind of legacy, right? Company that's been around 30 plus years. Um, when you decide you're going to do customer identification and customer segmentation, it's far easier. Why? Because I have a hundred years of data on my customers. Right. Right. I have 10,000 people in sales. Right. And so it becomes really easy to gather all that data, to aggregate all that data and to use data science to kind of figure this out. This is where we hit. This is where we miss. Mm-hmm. You forget about the whys. You just, this is where we hit. This is where we miss. When you're in a small company, that is infinitely harder, hmm. right? When you're, when your total customer base is, you know, 200, right? Right. Um, that is infinitely harder. Why do we hit and why do we miss? Well, we can take some educated guesses based on experiential, you know, knowledge, but, but we really don't have the data and the corpus of data is neither wide nor deep enough to be authoritative, right? Plus you've probably made 25 changes. So is it, is the reason that you failed because of the salesperson, because you changed the, the, the people doing the work, because you changed the format, because you changed the logo, because you changed any number of things could be right. But you don't have enough hits to really know. Um, and so now when you, when you say customer, do you mean individual or do you mean company? And does that make a difference? It, it makes no, no, no difference for me from, you know, from where I sit now, cause it's still, I mean, we have, we have thousands of individuals, fine, right. but, but it's still, you know, when I'm looking at it, it still comes down to a, a small number compared to, you know, the last organization I was at had millions of customers, Sure, right? 150 million end users kind of thing. Right. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's a scale where you can, you can actually do that math and you can do it relatively easily. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but when you're at a small company and you're trying to build that, you're trying to go through that growth phase oh, and that no. kind of. Um, the phase of getting stuff done, moving into the phase of professionalism. Um, that work is really, really, really hard because you simply lack the data. And, and yet you still have to try to be as uh, scientific about it as possible, right? You still have to kind of be okay. like, why are you doing it? What is the reason? What is your hypothesis? How do you test the hypothesis? What does good look like? How do we prove the hypothesis? How long are we willing to try to, to prove that hypothesis? Right? How do we fail fast? Kind of stuff. Right? All the all the things that you learn, but um, but it's 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 kind of it's very hard in a small company when you're doing that. Is the focus because of that more on customer segment, or or customer industry, or individual customer? By that, um, I mean, that no, it's uh, right now. It's really like what what what. So if I if I break my customers down, I segment my customers, right? And yeah. and and. Um, we'll look at it as companies, right? The B2B sales, right? And I break it down and I go, okay, what other businesses are we best at selling at? Right. And they fit in seven categories, right? right? Well, I have four salespeople, so I can't hit seven categories effectively, right? There's, there's, if I say there's 8,000 potential customers, right? Companies that we could potentially market to that Mm -hmm. that have budget that all that, that check all the other boxes. I can't touch 8,000. There's it's impossible. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then I, st- I have to start looking at, okay, well, if I can't really touch 8,000, where, where, where am I most effective and where do I want to be most effective? Those aren't necessarily the same things, right? So you need to kind of think about not just um, when I get up to bat, who do I hit against, 
right? But if there's people I don't hit against and I really want to hit against them, why do I want to hit against them? Should I want to hit against them? Right? And answering that question long before, how do I hit against them? Just am I do is that even the right thing? Mm-hmm. Right? Um, you know, we're we're a small analyst firm and there are companies that just don't talk to us. There's, right. there's a lot of competition in this space, and there's companies that just don't talk to us. And of course, those companies tend to be large. So our sales, our, our, our head of sales is like, oh, we need to get into those companies. Eh, but do we really? Do you evaluate yourself as an ecosystem? The reason why I ask the question is when, when we look at our organization, we say, what's our differentiator in some way, right? You, you're, we're an MSP. We have X amount of skills and Y amount of opportunities. We are one of 100 people, but where do we play in the picture of MSPs, right? We, yeah, 100%. We're, we're green here, we're yellow here, we're red there. Do you do the same thing or Absolutely. is, yeah, okay. Absolutely, right. Who are we? What's our differentiator? Is that the differentiator? Like, do, do we believe that or does the market say that? Right. Right. How do we validate that that is in fact our differentiator? How do we validate that it's a differentiator? Even if we think it's differentiating, right? How do we validate that it's, that it is in fact a differentiator? Um, do we like that as a differentiator? Mm -hmm. Right. If our customers don't see us that way, then, then what are we doing to make them see us a different way? Do we like the way they see us? Um, would we rather they saw us like we saw us and then how do we make them see us like we see us or the other way around, right? How do we right. change if we prefer the way they see us? How do we change it so we see us like they see us, right? right? And all of that alignment is really, is really critical, right? Um, there's a, there are a couple of, of kind of large tech vendors that have made the same mistake, right? Mm -hmm. They existed long before cloud. Cloud came along and they made this huge internal shift to cloud. Mm -hmm. And all their marketing started featuring cloud and all their assets started featuring cloud and all their new products featured cloud. And they kind of let the legacy business stagnate. Mm -hmm. They didn't intend to, right? You can only focus on so many things. And when you're focusing on things and, you know, that kind of green money, brown money, right? Your investment money is your green money. And when you're going to take your investment money and put it, tends to create the chatter, tends to create the rule, the conversation, yeah. right? And so they made people think that they were turning away from their legacy business. And more than one has done this. Right? This, this literally was a conversation we had this morning. Um, and then they go back and they go, why are our numbers suffering? Well, our numbers are suffering because we're not picking up that new business fast enough because, because of a number of reasons that don't mm -hmm. aren't really important. But we also failed to continue to feed and water the legacy business. Mm -hmm. So now that business we invested in isn't giving us the returns we had hoped for because we didn't do that correctly. But also, we've kind of sabotaged and killed the legacy business. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And, and but, it, but it's hard not to jump on the bandwagon sometimes, right? Gen AI, sure. Gen AI bandwagon, that's all we heard at Google Next. So how are we position all our go-to-market opportunities, whether it's content or event or just how we pitch ourselves in a Gen AI sense, just to ensure that we're seen as at the table if you wanted to have that conversation? Sure. Well, well, you have to be seen as being current, even if you disagree with what current says. <laughs> right. Right. Um, my my stepbrother uh, had been twenty twenty plus years. Um, so in the late nineties, um, newspapers were moving online, hmm. and of course, L.A. Times, New York Times, big papers had already moved online, but now all the little ones were moving. And so my brother was the um, editor for the online version of a paper newspaper that was relatively small right served kind of a little more than a county mm -hmm. um and i asked him i'm like dude your website and the stories you report on are garbage <laughs> like you're just you're reporting on how many I, I don't remember exactly what it was but we'll say you're reporting on the kardashians you're reporting on like you're reporting on stuff that doesn't matter to humanity and yet you're a member of the fourth estate you're supposed to report on the stuff that really has meaning and he goes i know and i go well well, don't tell me I know. What the fuck are you doing to fix it? What are you doing? Nothing. Yeah. nothing. I'm doing nothing to fix it. Well, why not? Because I can't. Well, why not? Because we're all fighting for eyeballs. Mm -hmm. And if I don't report the same thing that everyone else is reporting, then I'm seen to, as not being current. Mm -hmm. I'm seen, and pretty soon I'm not relevant. Even if being relevant has no meaning to society, no value to society, and is all garbage. If I mm -hmm. don't report on it, I'm immediately seen as not relevant, and before long, I'll just be I'll just be dead, 
right? My advertisers will leave, my readers will leave, and I'm dead. I'm out of business. Yeah. The incentive um, changes in media and therefore yeah, but it's know, net result is, is lack of investigative journalism. Sure, and sure. But, but it's the same everywhere, right? I was talking yeah. to someone that, that worked for a major insurance company that had killed their cyber insurance division, the whole division, they killed it. They, they no longer want to be in that business. And he's like, we were writing $5 billion in, we had $5 billion in revenue for that. And we just killed right. it. Why? Because well, we, we, if, we, if we wrote $5 billion in liability, we paid $5 billion out. Mm. Right? So what we were trying to do was go, okay, cool. How do we not do that? Well, we don't do that by changing the standards to which we write these insurance policies. Right. Right? Okay. In order to do that, we have to buck the trend that everyone else is doing. Right. Which right. means where our competition has a six page questionnaire, we have a 60 page questionnaire. Hmm. So no one fills out our questionnaire. Right. They fill out the six page questionnaire because why right. would they do more work? Yeah. They need someone to write the policy. Yeah. Right. And so we had to make the decision. Do we just give up and go, we're just going to write a six page questionnaire instead of a 60 page questionnaire so that we're competitive in the market? And at the same time, accept that we're just going to pay them out, or do we just kill the business unit? We just kill the business unit. Right. Right. There's so many places where that same logic applies that it makes it really hard to be revolutionary. Hmm. Right. My expectation is you do X, Y, and Z. If you just do X and Y, and I need Z ever even once, I'm just going to go to someone that does X, Y, and Z. Right. Right. And so you have to talk about Gen AI, even yeah. if you're like, yeah, you know, our advice is wait and see. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because you've got to produce content, analyst content related to Gen AI. I've got to have people-based services to support implementation and experimentation right. with Gen AI, even if the opportunities are low. Correct. Correct. Even when it, even if when it's said and done, you talk to fifty customers, and fifty customers go, "Well, actually, when it's all said and done, we're not going to do Gen AI yet." Right. Right. Oh, I'm still bill. I'm still burning the. I'm still burning the, the wage and labor costs, right? The burden, I still have the burden of those employees. I still have the burden of that business unit, right? Um, and, 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 you know, we've talked about this before, whether it's been on the podcast or not, right? I'm concerned about how long the telcos are going to keep their edge offerings the way they are, mm -hmm. right? They dump $150 million into an edge data center offering. They don't get $150 million in revenue because they haven't got a clue how to talk about it, Right. <laughs> Um, how long, uh, you know, at, at what point do the lines of learning to talk about it and willing to invest, like wh where, do, where is that horizon point? Um, right. And, and are they just going to stop? They're just going to kill that business unit because it's not worth continue ma maintaining the burden for a five year, six year, seven, eight year payoff. Mm -hmm. Right. When we're looking at ROI quarter by quarter, having to make a five year investment isn't terribly bright. Right. Mm hmm. And some of that comes from, um, you know, like that specifically. Um, okay, well, who, who you can have run it? Well, I need someone that has 20 years of telco experience and 10 years of edge experience. Okay, that doesn't exist. <laughs> it just doesn't exist. Right. So, so pick one. And they go, okay, well, we'll take the 20 years of telco experience. Ooh, wrong pick. Because <laughs> they don't know. Because you don't about understand that. edge. And if yeah. you don't know edge, you can't talk, talk to it. Hey, guess right. what, guys? If you hire someone that understands the customer and you're a business that like, let's say you're just keep it at telco, right? If you'd have hired the edge expert and not promoted someone from elsewhere in the telco, the edge person would have 250,000 employees to ask any telco questions to. Right. Yeah. It, we already have that knowledge. We right. don't have to add to it. But as you have no edge knowledge, you, right. the person that you put in charge of edge has no one in the company to ask about edge. Right. So, so you continue to not accomplish the very thing you've set out to. Mm -hmm. And it's so weird to me. Companies do that all the time. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. It's a new business unit. Hire someone that understands the customer. Don't mm -hmm. hire someone that understands your business. You already understand your business. You have plenty of tribal knowledge about your business. You can teach people how that works. You can partner them with someone. You can give them someone that's, that's a mentor. You can give them someone to escort them through that. Right. Give them a partner in the organization. Right. It's likely that three of the people that report to them will understand the business really well. And that happened in a previous organization. We Everywhere. didn't have any storage experts in our team in any real sense. 
<laughs> right. Because we had lots of storage people in the organization. We didn't have to augment right, that right, by right. having our own experts. Right. We, we didn't needed experts in experts. Industry, right. Right. It's so, what made us unique. Um, at yeah. the same time, it, it's what it, it is also what made us so hard for the rest of the business to understand. Right. <laughs> and then, don't follow the strategy. Yeah. Well, but then when we left, look what happened to all that business. Mm -hmm. Right. Down the drain. Right. And it's, it's, it's again, right. It's, it's kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face. Right. So we experiencing it, but for our audience, I like what you just said, both of you. Can you go a little bit deeper into how do you bring that leader? Because normally you look for someone to have the expertise of that area. Mm -hmm. How do you hire or bring someone to lead that new business or that new organization to help it grow? Can you go a little bit deeper into how you think to bring that person in? Trust. That's how you do it. Right? We, we pretend we trust and we don't actually trust. <laughs> we, we don't. We don't. And that's, that's actually the hard thing, right? Because you're, you're effectively standing on the edge of a cliff and someone else is saying, I can make the jump. And you're going, well, everyone I've ever seen make the jump has failed or I've never seen anyone even attempt the jump because it's too high. Mm -hmm. So how do, I, how do I interview you to determine if you know how to make the jump? Right. right? And yeah. that's why we end up with what we end up with. We end up with it because it's much more comfortable. If, I, if, I, if I'm working in telco and I've been in telco for 25 years and I'm an SVP and I have this new business unit that's going to start, I know every question to ask someone to validate that they have telco experience. Right. I have zero experience in asking someone questions to validate they understand why someone would buy edge computing. Yeah. You, you right? have to interview for uh, comfort with ambiguity. Yep. Right. You're going to say, you're going to come in here. You've shown through your career that you've created and implemented successful line of businesses or businesses anyway, regardless of topic. Know that when you come in, we're I, we're going to give you a bunch of rope because I don't know how to judge your success. The only thing I'll be able to do is trust that what you're doing is the right thing you need to do and hope that when we see things faltering, that we can make corrections quick. Right. And if it's wildly successful, then everybody wins, but it's the, you have to be comfortable in the organization with this ambiguity. And that person has to be uh, comfortable with ambiguity that they're not getting any direction from us. That, that, that's a tough match. Well, and, and for some strange reason, we keep telling we keep telling leaders you're not allowed to say you don't know. Right. And you kind of have to say, look, you have to understand, I don't know this business. I'm right. hiring you because you know this business. I know Telco, and I'm here to make sure that you get all the information you need on Telco, that you understand how this business works, how it runs, how it operates, everything. Right. But I don't know Telco. So I'm not going to help. Uh, sorry, I don't know Edge, so I'm not going to help you with Edge. You're the Edge expert. Right. You tell me what you need. I will make sure that you have it, and I'll tell you how to make it work inside this organization. Right. Right. And we don't we don't encourage people to do that. Right? No. We don't encourage leaders to do that, and it makes them uncomfortable. And, or worse, we promote a really really good telco person, as you mentioned, to Edge, presuming that they can learn the subject matter. Sure, it's the when, modern principle. Yeah. It, it's never in our best interest. It's never worked effectively. Nope. And maybe you get lucky every so often, but that is not the journey to success. Nope. No, and I, and I see the same thing, right? When, when companies go from having a B2C business and want to do a B2B business, mm -hmm. and they're like, well, we're just going to take our best seller from, B to, from, from B2C and move them over to B2B. Right. And, and you're like, oh, they have no idea how to talk to anybody in a business ever for any reason. <laughs> and they fail miserably. And you're like, but they were really good sellers. No. Yeah. No. Enterprise sales is very different. You need people that under, understand enterprise. Commercial versus enterprise is very, very different. You need people that understand that. Right? But even within enterprise, if we have a whole host of people that really, really know how to talk to CIO down and then have an expectation that they can go build a relationship with the CMO and CFO and sure. chief supply officer, that's just as difficult. Right? They don't have the words to use on what might be appealing or interesting to that new set of people. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'm seeing, I'm seeing constantly, continuously at, at almost every company I talk to that's been around a minute is they're making a pivot from a hardware to a software company. Mm -hmm. Okay, your buyer is totally different. Do you know right. how to talk to that buyer? Do you understand their language? Right, if you went from talking to the storage team to talking to the, ne to the, to the DevOps team, yeah, your sales people are all going to fail. Right. Nah, no, they're not. 
okay, cool. Call me in a year. And in a year, I get a call. This has happened. I get a call. Yeah, you're right. They don't know how to talk to them. Right. 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 And frankly, the, the com customer hears your name or sees it in the email and just goes, yeah, you need to go talk to the storage or the networking team or the blah, blah, blah team. The right. not me team is yeah. who you need to talk to. Because that's all you know. Right. Right. But And all of it comes from, well, I mean, it comes from hubris. Mm -hmm. We've been around a long time. We've been successful. We, therefore, we know how to do this. That doesn't, it doesn't work that way at all. Right. Start with people that are experts and just ask somebody, hey, look, how does this actually work? Right. Talk to people that have run DevOps teams and go, hey, like if I came to you and said this, what would you say? Uh, I would say go talk to the other team. Okay, cool. How do I make you listen? Will mm -hmm. you start by not making yourself sound like you're trying to sell me hardware? <laughs> that's right. Right? Because that's what they do. It all sounds like you're selling hardware. But but no, that doesn't that doesn't work. I don't think about that. I don't care about that. I I don't even want to think about the infrastructure any more than I have to think about the infrastructure. So how do you make me not think about the infrastructure? Right. My job is an in infrastructure management. I'm in DevOps. My job is getting getting code pushed. That's right. my job. Yeah. Right? Automation. Correct. As as automated, as seamless, as accurately as possible. Right. Right. Because I've got I've got I've got twice as many commits that need to be pushed per week as I have hours in the week. Right. Right. And so your lack of understanding of my job does not endear me to want to buy your product. <laughs> it is in fact a waste of time. So then circling back to the original conversation, when you're looking at go to market changes and you want to evaluate your existing customers and your desired customers, do you spend more time with who you want to sell to or spend more time gathering data on your existing customers, like a, 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 um, a customer satisfaction survey? Uh, who I want to spend time with, not who I do spend time with. Okay. Right. Because, because again, it's really easy to fall into that comfort zone. Right. Like I've said this before, I don't care about the sale wins we get. I care about the losses. Hmm. Right. Because a win has too many, too much luck in it for me. It was the right. right day at the right time at the right piece of the budget cycle, saying the right words that I'm never going to remember. I had a connection with that person like all of those things, right? I don't, maybe they were pissed off and they were leaving in two weeks and they had some budget to spend and they didn't really care where it went. You know what I mean? Like, and we've actually had a customer buy that way. We they enjoyed the last thank you, but right. Like, you know, whatever it is, right? I don't, I don't, I want to study my losses. Why didn't that work? Why didn't that resonate? Because that I can fix. I can't, what, how do I fix a win? Right. I won. I don't fix a win. Right. right. And every, every attempt to duplicate a win comes with with some level of with some high level of failure but every single failure i can probably think back and go okay i know the moment that went wrong right right like it's it's so much easier to identify the trigger point and then go okay well you know we lose here consistently because of x y and z right okay so so does that mean is that why we win here well we do tend like if we if we make those opposites and then we look at it we can we can then go oh well we do actually tend to win when those things are flipped Okay, mm -hmm. so then how do we create more opportunities to flip those? Or how do we create more opportunities to not do those other things? Right. right. And, the, and the losses are interesting, but not being even being at the table is the most difficult Correct. data to get. Right, so Correct. If you could have a massive pipeline um, and still not hitting the growth targets you're looking for. Because you're not closing as much as you think you need to, and looking at the 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 losses gives you that data. But what it doesn't give you is what a hundred times pipeline might not need to look like. How, how do you how do you achieve that goal to get to the to get to the customers that are currently going to your biggest competitor? Yeah, no, that's that's very hard. But also, like I, I would challenge does does the fact that they're going to your customer make them or your competitor make them your customer yeah right like are they going to your competitor simply because that's the easy button and you're not the easy button are they going there because you think that you're like that competitor but maybe you're really not or they think you're like that competitor but you're also not right right or does that competitor offer something that's really appealing to them and unappealing to the other 80 percent that you're not even looking at should you be looking at the other 80 percent so the key is to go to that competitor's conference and then go to Disney every night. That is correct. That's, okay. correct. that's, exactly, <laughs> that's exactly the key. Got it. Got it. I just want to make sure that that's part of the, 
the recipe to improve your go-to-market. All right. Speaking of which, <laughs> I think we're going to have the very first like in-person opportunity to hang out with, uh, with Paul and Howard and get the Disney experience. Nice. Right. So Tuesday, Tuesday. Yes. The week of Gartner CIO symposium. 16th. Yep. Right. We will be going to Disney, and we we are happy to offer anyone that would like to join us the opportunity to buy a ticket and come, and we'll set up a meeting place, um, and we'll all kind of do the Disney tour together on Tuesday. Nice. So if you want to see what Disney looks like through the eyes of, of Paul and Howard and look for some hidden Mickeys and get a little bit of the background and, and a right. little bit of kind of, even on the rides, right, a little bit of the, hey, this is how this ride works, and this is why this is interesting. Um, it might be a good opportunity Tuesday, the 16th of October in, uh, in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> so click the link below so you can subscribe <laughs> to be in the list. That's right. Carlos so, Vargas, interesting conversation. Yeah, that was an interesting. And I think that it's important for probably to understand how when things are changing, what you should focus on to help grow the business. Uh, I took down legacy business is not growing because you have not invested on it. And a lot of times we, like you said, you go after the shiny new object and then everything else starts going down the drain. I'm like, what happened? Oh, we need to probably pay a little bit more attention to everything else. So, my friends, make sure that you share, you subscribe, and we'll see you on our next episode.